Hello, and welcome to Great.com Talks With. Today, we're talking with Kevin Rink, president of FAM, an organization whose mission is to create a more fair and effective justice system that respects American values of individual accountability and dignity while keeping communities safe. And if you're new to our podcast, please press subscribe button either on YouTube or your podcast app, because today we're going to learn about an organization that is helping transform America's criminal justice system by uniting the voices of impacted families and in individuals and elevating the issues all across the country. Hello, Kevin. Welcome to Great.com Talks. It's very excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Could you please describe FAM for someone who is not familiar with your work? Sure. FAM is an organization, a nonprofit organization that's been around for 30 years. This year is our 30th anniversary. And it was focused on changing our criminal sentencing laws. The United States is an outlier. Um, we use harsh mandatory minimum sentencing laws and extreme sentences to punish people of crimes. And though the United States has slightly more violence in other countries, our prison population is the biggest in the world and has been for many years. We're the world's leading um, incarcerator. And so our focus has been reforming our criminal sentencing laws to give judges more discretion so that they can impose sentences that fit the crime and the unique circumstances of the defendant. Too often right now, we have one size fits all sentences that send people away for too long. And so for 30 years, we've been working on that. And in the past few years, we've been also working on prison reform because our view is that while people are away, they should get access to rehabilitation, you know, programming, classes, treatments that will help them succeed when they get out. And too often now, our prisons just warehouse people and don't help them get back on their feet. And so they wind up back in prison. So our focus has shifted to both sentencing reform and prison reform with the goal of using prison less often, sending people fewer people to prison for mostly shorter sentences. Um, and then while they're there, making sure they have access to programming that helps them succeed when they get out. Mm -hmm. It's very unfortunate that the United States uh, leads uh, when it comes to the number of uh, incarcerated uh, uh, people in the world. But you mentioned that it's because of the harsh justice system. It's because of the harsh sentence uh, rules that are in place. This is the result of that. And the fact that your organization has been working in that direction for 30 years and addressing the issue and um, proposing um, different reforms that would uh, change the current status quo is uh, incredible. You mentioned uh, that um, the prison population in the United States uh, is quite large, so the prisons are overpopulated uh, with inmates. What has resulted in that? What kind of problems are there uh, with the current justice system of United States that is resulting in overpopulation of prisons, besides uh, what you described of a harsh sentencing? Yeah, it, it, it's just a um... Uh, part of the United States' problem is that we do have more lethal violence in other country and that, uh, countries, and that's because of the proliferation of guns. So we just have more people who are armed. We have more violent crimes or lethal, deadly crimes. And so you're going to see longer sentences as a result of that. But we also rely on life without punishment. Um, I mean, life without parole sentences and other extreme punishments more than other countries do. And I think this is just rooted in you know, this American sense of individual responsibility. And when somebody commits a crime, there's no sense of maybe it's the conditions of society, maybe this person's in poverty. We don't sort of examine why something happened. Instead, we just throw the book at somebody. So we have this sort of randomized severity. We don't catch everybody who commits crimes, but when we do catch somebody, we punish them so severely. And that has the effect of not deterring other people from committing crime, because what deters people from committing crime is they're, how, how likely they think it is that they're gonna get caught. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when people commit crime, they're younger and they're not thinking about what the punishment they're gonna receive is. They're just thinking they're not gonna get caught. And so to not catch a lot of people, but instead to randomize, randomly punish you know, the few people you do catch severely is not an effective justice system. So we have a problem of like higher crime and then also this huge incarceration rate. So we're not doing it right. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, if you look at other countries around the world, their prisons are focused on rehabilitation. The idea is when somebody goes away, 
that we don't want to remove them so much from society and from their families that it will be hard for them to integrate when they come back. And in the United States, we don't do that. We put our prisons far away from population centers. Um, as I mentioned, they're basically warehouses that hold people. They don't give them a lot of programming or productive activities to do. And so they've removed from their society, their communities. And when they come back, you know, the same antisocial behaviors can resurface pretty quickly. And so we have a high rate of recidivism. So we're just doing a lot of things wrong that's contributing to this highest population, prison population in the world. Mm -hmm. I really liked um, when you made the distinction this, uh, we're looking at the responsibility of the individual uh, when they are committing crime, but we're not looking at the responsibility of the society. We're not looking at the conditions that the person that led um, for the person to commit a crime. So instead of the addressing the challenges uh, pre-factum, we're addressing um, the results post-factum. So we're just saying that this individual committed things, so he should be responsible for all all his life without parole or um, or harsher sentence rather than saying that, oh, we need to reform this, um, be a more um, social, uh, provide social conditions for, for people, economic conditions for people so that they do not uh, perform um, crimes uh, based on, because they are in need of social or uh, economic services. So the fact that uh, there is a distinction on that and you are proposing that if um, we take um, look at the picture from a higher, uh, from a helicopter view and address the challenges um, that lead to these crimes, the number of crimes even might um, decrease and the, the uh, prison population might not be as uh, crowded as it is at the moment. And you mentioned the fact that uh, uh, if you look at the other organ uh, other countries, for instance, if you look at Denmark or Norway, their uh, prisons are indeed uh, focused on rehabilitation, whereas in the US it's not that way. So the example of the Scandinavian countries show that if we are, if we focus on the rehabilitation, the results can be uh, much better. So that's quite interesting distinction that you. Um, yeah, and, and, and we still believe in individual accountability. I mean, people, you know, we're not against punishment. We're not against holding people accountable. It's just we want to match the punishment to sort of the unique facts and circumstances of the offense. And so, you know, there's the Jean Valjean who's stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family. And then there's maybe a international bread stealing ring that is has different motives and different impacts. And so you want to be able to separate those two out. And our laws too often impose a one size fits all punishment that doesn't allow for those distinctions to be made. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, that's a great analogy and great example. Yeah. <laughs> It's not discrediting um, the crime that the person did, but uh, it's looking at the whole picture together. So we still want the person to take accountability. We still want the person to be uh, um, sentenced according to the just law rather than having a one unique solution for everyone. So that's an uh, important distinction. Um, you mentioned that you, um, as an organization, you guys, uh, you want to have a solution that doesn't necessarily one solution for all and you are working on uh, reforming and proposing reforms for the current justice system. Could you please describe what kind of reforms in the ju current justice system do you see um, uh, coming in place uh, based on uh, your research, based on the uh, accumulated data you have gathered uh, over the years? Sure. Well, I mean, our primary focus is making sure that judges have discretion to make the distinctions we're talking about, mm -hmm. to, to understand the unique facts, the circumstances of each case, because no two crimes are the exact same. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times what that means is we're working in various states and at the federal level to eliminate mandatory minimum sentencing laws. And just for people who don't know, mandatory minimum sentencing laws, most crimes, there's a range of punishment that the legislature will set. And they say somebody who commits this crime could get up to 30 years. A mandatory minimum law says you can get up to 30 years, but no less than 10 years, which means a judge no longer has discretion to give anywhere between zero and 30. They have to give that 10 years. And so that's a mandatory sentence. And that has contributed to the increase in our prison population. So both at the federal and state level, we're trying to get rid of those mandatory minimum sentences. In addition, we're trying to attack extreme sentences. We're trying to you know, attack these reliance on life without parole sentences, three strikes and you're out sentences, which is this idea that if you commit a third crime, you go away for life. So that's another way where we think, even if somebody has committed 
the number of offenses, the judge has to be able to consider all the facts and circumstances. We can't just have a one size fits all punishment. So that's really what we're driving at, both you know, for low level offenders, but even for more serious offenders, having that discretion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for highlighting those um, unique cases that may not be similar to the rest of the world, but they are unique uh, to United States. You mentioned the minimum one and the maximum one, although there is uh, from zero to 30, but because of the federal rules that the minimum sentence ones, uh, people, uh, judges you mentioned, don't have a choice between uh, putting a sentence from 10 to 10, uh, from zero to 10 years, because, because due to the federal laws, they are required to put like minimum. 10 years. So interesting uh, distinction. Um, So the fact that your organization is addressing that and bringing all attention, all the details and attention to the um, uh, judges who are uh, making decisions is is very important. The second area of your work that you uh, mentioned is working is on prison reform. So you want to, um, you mentioned um, for the prisons to be a case of the rehabilitation service uh, place rather than just a, a punishment place. Could you please describe in detail what kind of uh, prison ref- uh, reforms do you um, suggest and how those ref- uh, reforms uh, would impact the life of inmates? Sure. Well, we think when somebody's in prison, you know, this is a time for them both to reflect on their wrongdoing, but also to either gain social skills or professional skills that they didn't have when they were outside to get treatment for any drug or alcohol problem they may have or anger management, take cognitive behavioral therapy, do anything that helps them, you know, leave prison better than they went in. And too often our prisons don't have that programming for people. And so what we want to do is make sure that's available. Also, In our prisons right now, people have no computer access or internet access. Now we realize sometimes that's not appropriate, but they're falling behind society. So if you're in prison for 10 years, you know, people come out. I mean, I was in prison for a period of time and people in prison would talk about what's an app. They didn't even know what an app on a phone was. Mm -hmm. And now they're gonna go back out to society and try to compete with people for jobs. And they're totally left behind by society. So we want to make sure that people are not left behind, that they get access to programming, to, again, uh, mental health treatment, substance abuse treatment, things that will uh, treat whatever the root causes are, what, you know, uh, force them or contribute to their committing crimes. The other thing we want to make sure is that our prisons have independent oversight. I'm afraid to say that too many of our prisons are just the site of awful abuse, Uh, women being abused by guards, uh, violence in between prisoners, And there's no oversight or accountability. These prisons are located, as I said, far away from population centers. Um, The prison system is the fox watching the hen house. They really have no incentive to report abuses. And so bad things are happening in our prisons. And if you're not safe, you're not going to recover. You're not going to become better. You can't study. You can't program. You can't get treatment if you feel unsafe in that your environment. And so one of the things we're also trying to push is for independent oversight so that we have professionals outside the prison system who are inspecting prisons, talking to both prisoners and guards to make sure that the living and working conditions are safe. Mm -hmm. So as I see, there are two directions that you are working on. The first one is safety. So uh, you want uh, to, the reforms that you are suggesting, you want to make sure that the prison population feels safe. Um, There is no uh, um, uh, hurdle between the guards. The guards are not taking advantage of the prison uh, inmates, as well as that there is no um, division and there is no uh, coalition and fights between different uh, prison members. So uh, the living conditions would be safe for them further on to concentrate on their um, reflection, reflecting of their behavior and uh, change their behavior so they can be um, better, uh, better, readier um, when they go out. And the second part you mentioned on providing the tools that are necessary for them, for their personal development uh, in terms of not get uh, getting enough, being um, up to date on things that are happening in the world. So once they are out of the prison, they don't lose 10 years or five years of 15 years and uh, the transition process um, back to the society will be uh, smoother, uh, much faster, and uh, it will allow them to um, be um, with their families and uh, be uh, full members of the society as soon as possible. So that's very important uh, distinction um, to realize. 
Uh, you mentioned our uh, you uh, organization FAM has been uh, working for 30 years and in those 30 years uh, you were able uh, to achieve for more than uh, 500,000 Americans to receive shorter and fairer uh, prison sentences. Could you please describe how were you able to achieve uh, such impact? Sure. At, at both the federal level at Congress and in the state legislatures, we were able to convince lawmakers to change their sentencing laws, to get rid of mandatory minimum sentences so that judges had discretion to give shorter, fairer sentences. Also at the federal level, um, we've been involved in Supreme Court cases where we helped convince the Supreme Court to change the sentencing guidelines that judges use to give sentences from making those mandatory to making those advisory so that the judges still have more discretion. Um, and also the guidelines itself that are sent by, that are established by the United States Sentencing Commission. These are something that all federal judges, when they sentence somebody, they start by looking at the guidelines. We've been able to convince the commission to lower some of those guidelines so that the sentences they're, not, they're starting at aren't so high. And so as a result of reforms from the sentencing guidelines and then legislative changes at the state level, we've been able to, you know, create the kind of change that has helped, you know, over 500,000 people and more get shorter, fairer sentences. And, you know, I've got to say that while a lot of that was happening, crime was continuing to fall. And so we saw the crime rate fall and prison populations fall. And for a lot of people, they didn't think that was possible. They thought if you let people out of prison, you're going to get more crime. But it just shows that, you know, we went too far. We were locking up too many people for too long. And we were able to get some people safely released without affecting the crime rate. In fact, crime fell. Mm -hmm. Wow. The impact that you were able to make both on the state level as well as the federal level to change legislation uh, to favor uh, more, um, uh, to have a principle and guideline uh, prepared uh, for judges to make decisions, as well as you mentioned, uh, you took uh, cases to the, the highest court of the country, uh, Supreme Court, and you were able to defend and make uh, changes that have resulted in uh, fairer and shorter sentences uh, while keeping um, the uh, crime rates low. So there, that's very um, indicative and great result to see o over such a short period of time. One of the other um, key projects that your organization has is a 1000 uh, Stories project. Could you please tell us about this project and, some of this, uh, and share some of the stories that are a part of this 1000 uh, Stories? Sure. Well, we have a project now called A Thousand Stories, but truly storytelling is an important part of FAM's theory of change mm -hmm. because crime is a very visceral and emotional issue. And people respond with emotional, you know, uh, reactions to, uh, you know, how they were raised. Do we need to be tougher on people? Should we be more, you know, forgiving or merciful? And so people have judgments about it. And we are not going to win debates, and we have found this to be true over the course of 30 years. We are not going to win these debates solely by talking about statistics and recidivism, you know, numbers and abstract concepts and facts and figures. These are all important. We need data and evidence. But the way to change hearts and minds is really to do it in that order and to reach people's hearts first. And so what FAM has sought to do, and through the A Thousand Story Project most recently, is tell the stories of people who have been unduly harmed by our harsh sentencing laws. Because when they can see themselves in some of these stories, then they think, well, maybe there is something wrong with that law. If I just described it and said, oh, you know, this law punishes people with 10 years, they may say, well, that doesn't sound bad because they imagine the worst case scenario. And then when they see how it's actually applied to a real person, then they understand how it doesn't fit. And I'll give you an example. There's been, a, there's been laws in a lot of our states and most recently in Tennessee that punished people more harshly if they sold drugs within a thousand feet of a school or a public library. Now, the intention there was great because you would think we don't want people preying on children um, and selling them dangerous drugs um, when they're at their public library or they're on the school grounds. So in our mind's eye, we have this idea of some serious drug offender, you know, pushing drugs on kids on a school playground. And we want to punish that more harshly. And so that's what the law did. It jacked up this prison sentence if you were caught doing that. The way it worked, in fact, though, was that the law applied whether it was summer 
and school was out of session. It applied over the weekends. So if somebody was selling drugs uh, just on this playground on a Saturday night when no kids were around, they still got the enhanced punishment. And because it was a thousand feet, you had people living in their apartments selling drugs to one another, but they were technically within 1,000 feet of a school. And so they're clearly not what lawmakers had in mind when they imposed, you know, when they created those punishments. And yet that's who they were being applied to. You even had cases where law enforcement was setting up people by inviting them, you know, confidential informant to sell drugs within a thousand feet so they could get those enhanced punishments. So we were doing things that were not increasing public safety at all, but using this harsher punishing, uh, you know, sentencing scheme. And so we were able in Tennessee and other states to get those laws repealed, to point out to them that these nets were being cast too wide. And if you wanted to punish somebody for selling drugs to kids, you could write a law that did that. But to just say arbitrarily, if you're within a thousand feet of a school, you're going to get an increased punishment. That didn't make sense. And it was hurting people and families. And so that's the type of thing where a story can explain that so much better than just, you know, facts and evidence and data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. When we talk about uh, facts, we see like, oh, it's somewhere else. Or if you talk about number, oh, it's not, I don't know, it's just a number. But then when you put a face into the uh, uh, number, when you put the picture into the number and you share the stories as your organization is doing, then we see the real impact, the real uh, picture, the real um, situation of what is happening. And although some of the things that uh, legislation might have done might be of a good intention, uh, but but uh, in an implementation, instead of um, truly solving the uh, uh, problem, it's actually um, leading to overpopulation of prisons because uh, because of those uh, tiny little details uh, that are resulting in uh, harsher punishment. So the fact that your organization is doing the story sharing and uh, storytelling and bringing uh, a face, bringing um, uh, a case uh, to the picture, to the numbers picture and uh, uh, shedding a light uh, into the solution is very, um, very, very important. If someone would like to support FAM, how can they do that? Well, the easiest thing to do is just go to our website, fam.org, F-A-M-M.org. Um, or they can, if they're, especially if they're in the States, they can text 21 or text FAM, F-A-M-M, to 21333. And the reason to do that is not only can you give, but then you can get our emails and alerts and join us in taking action to change the system. Mm, wonderful. The link to the FAM website will be provided in the description. So you viewing and listening can go to the website and familiarize yourself with the great work uh, Kevin and the team at FAM are doing. Thank you so much, Kevin. It was wonderful to get to know you and the great work your organization is doing. Thank you so much for making this opportunity possible. Wonderful. For you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, please press like and share button because this will show the YouTube and podcast algorithm that this conversation is important, that we need to create a more fair and effective justice system. Thank you and see you in the next episode.